So, uh, so just to begin, we have some guiding questions, and this is to help you uh, track what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're really going to be focusing in on um, how to reformulate a psychodynamic conflict as an affect phobia. And so for those of you who are not familiar with um, psychodynamic theory, this is going to be very helpful to you. Then we're going to help you understand how to apply um, the affect phobia uh, concept to Malin's two triangles, which are the triangle of conflict and triangle of person. And I know most of you are familiar with those triangles. And so we're really going to be thinking about why are people defending against affects and how are they defending against them. Uh, we're looking at like destructive patterns and uh, how they originated and how they're being maintained. So that would be like what is the origin of the affect phobia and how is the affect phobia being maintained in everyday life? Then we'll also, just like our last uh, webinar, focus in on the differences between adaptive, inhibitory, and defensive affects. So, uh, so you know, my hope is that by the end of today, you'll really have a stronger understanding of what an affect phobia is and how to use the triangles in your work because that's what really matters is that when you're done with this webinar, you can go straight back to the office and you're going to have a lot more confidence with the triangles in terms of like how to use them for assessment, but then also how to use them for interventions. And, uh, and, and what always helps is just really being able to understand the difference between inhibitory, maladaptive, and adaptive affect. If you know the triangles, you can do this work. So uh, treating affect phobia, we're using this book to help guide us with the webinars right now, and today's focus is all on chapter two. So when you're done, if you want to practice more, just pick up the treating affect phobia workbook and study chapter two, and feel, there's a lot of exercises in there and examples to help the work come um, more to life. Uh, you know, another thing that is helpful is we wrote an article in um, this book, and uh, it's a real uh, good basic article about APT and how it works. If anyone does need a copy of the article, please feel free to email me at Kristen at KristenOsborne.com, and I'll get that to you. Uh, so the first part of our webinar is you know, reformulating psychodynamic conflict as affect phobia. And, uh, and so, you know, just real quick, I know we went through this at our last webinar, but what is an affect phobia? The long and the short of it is someone has a phobic reaction to a specific feeling. And instead of allowing themselves to experience that feeling or to express it, or even allow themselves to be near that feeling, they, they pull back with inhibitory affects. Uh, anxiety, guilt, shame, pain, and, and, and they pull back and pull back so they actually don't need to experience that feeling. And at a certain point, when the inhibitory affects become too uncomfortable, they unconsciously activate a defense in order to block the, the feeling that they're uh, experiencing a phobia toward. And, uh, and so this is no different than external phobias. And most of us have at least one external phobia. We know what it's like to be afraid of a snake and see one slithering across the path and we just automatically jump back, you know, and maybe start screaming or, or start running away. Well, that's, that's a phobic reaction to um, a snake. And people have that same kind of intense reaction to feelings that they are phobic to. So, you know, when you look at what is a psychodynamic conflict in APT, it's pretty simple. It's an affect phobia. <laughs> so, you know, it's a conflict about feelings. It's a phobia about feelings. And what it means is that whenever you get close to that adaptive, activating affect, you know, instead of being able to experience that affect and all the wonderful behaviors that go with it, all that, the power that goes with it, a person's pulling back with an inhibitory affect, and then at some point it may lead to um, defenses being activated. So, you know, in APT, people are always wondering, like, are we working with conscious feeling? Are we working with unconscious feeling? And something to keep in mind is that the feelings that we're working with are primary feelings, they're feelings that we're born with. 
but it's 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 what we're really paying attention to is when people have an inhibitory affect arise in the face of a primary affect and 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 we're looking at how their inhibitory affect causes them great discomfort with anxiety, guilt, shame, and pain, and then how that activates the defenses that actually block off all access to the primary affect. And so on some level, some people are conscious that this is happening. You know, I know for myself these days, if I'm feeling angry at someone, I could feel a little rise in my inhibitory affects, but I'm, I'm really in balance, so I'm able to say, oh, you know, I'm getting quite anxious in the face of this person. I wonder if I'm angry with them. Oh, yes, I am. You know, what do I want to do about it? And, and then I'm able to employ an action that's helpful to me. So I'm really conscious about what's happening. But with a lot of our clients, they're not so conscious. They don't quite know that they have a phobia to a specific feeling, and they're not quite aware that they're experiencing this rise of inhibitory affect um, that's deploying their defenses. And so some people are conscious, a lot of people are unconscious. And the work that we do as therapists is help people become conscious of their affect phobia. We're marrying back to them. Uh, if, if we see um, any phobic response so that they can begin to understand, oh, in the face of anger, I'm feeling really guilty and I start running away. Okay. Uh, and so, um, so why is um, an affect phobia unconscious? I mean, the long and the short of it is it's just too painful. You know, it, it's too painful to face the feeling, to face any person or situation that is associated with the feeling. Uh, it's, um, you know, you see this a lot with um, trauma survivors, and they might have a phobic reaction to a certain place where the trauma uh, happened, you know, and, and they, they just will avoid that place at all costs, and that's conscious. Some of them have trauma triggers that are not so conscious that they're also avoiding. And so it's with with the a phobic feeling, um, it's the same thing. Is that it, the feeling can just bring out so much discomfort that a person is unconscious of the fact that they're pulling away from it and activating uh, their defenses. Uh, so you know what what are the um, purposes of the defenses? I mean, th this is really really important when you're working with people. Because, um, you know, I have come to the point that I, I understand that people really need to know their defenses. They have to really know um, how their defenses help them, how they hurt them, where they originate from. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the more that we can help our clients understand how they're using their defenses, I think the faster the work can go. Because if we can be compassionate about our defenses, if, if we can on some level love our defenses, then it's going to be a lot easier to let them go in order to um, connect with adaptive affect. And so, you know, with defenses, people will use it, um, use defenses to avoid or eliminate from consciousness the adaptive activating affect. And um, they'll also reduce any struggle conscious struggle that's happening inside of them between the activating affect and the inhibitory responses. So, um, so you know, how do we categorize defenses? Uh, you know, anyone who works with me knows that we go over this over and over and over again. I can tell you that if you go to the Affect Phobia Therapy um, uh, website, on the research page under Research Scales, um, or actually, I think it's the uh, forms page. There's something called the PAC form in there. And it's a seven-page assessment form that Lee McCullough developed that you can give to uh, your clients um, before the first session. And um, this PAC form can really help us gather a lot of information about our clients and how they're using anxiety and defenses in their life. And it's, it's very helpful. But for the most part, you know, we categorize defenses as maladaptive feelings, behaviors, and thoughts. We categorize them as symptoms. You know, so if somebody comes to you and they have generalized anxiety disorder, 
um, they have um, major depression. You know, we're, we're looking at these um, diagnoses uh, in order to see what defenses someone's employing. And, uh, you know, as you get more familiar with um, how we categorize defenses, uh, then, then it becomes easier to use them. And, uh, and so we'll be talking more about defenses as we go along today. So, uh, so you know, the next part of our webinar today is, is understanding affect phobia by using Malin's two triangles. And this is really going to help everything that I've just talked about today come more to life. So uh, the first thing to look at is um, David Mallon's two triangles. And uh, if there's anything that you need to know in APT, it's the two triangles. And so if you see here, we have the therapist over in the left-hand corner, the past at the bottom, and the current in the right-hand corner. This is the triangle of person, and uh, it refers to the origin of the defenses. Okay? so. You, you know, if you move over to the right, you see um, defenses on the left, inhibit, inhibition on the right, and adaptive on, on the bottom. And, you know, if somebody has a block to adaptive affect, right, you want to be wondering, well, where did that block come from? Because we know defenses come at an early age. And so at what time... How old was your client when they started to deploy a defense that you might be seeing in your office? So, um, so don't worry if this still feels confusing. We'll be talking about it more. But these are da David Mallon's two triangles. And he termed um, his uh, theory the universal principle of psych psychodynamic theory. And the two triangles are how he demonstrates that theory. And so the, this theory is very helpful in understanding how affect phobias are developed, maintained, and resolved. What do I mean by that? If you go back here to the triangle of um, person, right? We want to look at the past. Where did the origin of the defense start, right? And then we want to look at the current. How is that defense being played out in relationships in your client's life today, right? Then you look at the therapist. How is it being played out with you, the therapist. And so that's why we spend so much time focusing in on our own emotions and helping us understand, like, what are our affect phobias? You know, what, what, what emotions do we tend to um, be phobic about in session? Because the more that we know ourselves and the more that we understand how we react with emotion, the clearer we are in terms of understanding What's our patient's um, triangles and, and what are our own? And, and so it's really nice to be in session and just be clear, okay, I didn't have a therapist affect phobia come up. This is truly my patient. And then, of course, because we work in collaboration, you can point that out to your patient and mirror to them what you're seeing and, and be able to start talking about their triangles. And so, you know, the triangle of conflict represents defenses and anxieties that block the expression of true feeling. So one thing you want to be thinking about with the triangle is, and I'm going to show this slide to help you, is that if somebody has a block to a feeling, they don't have access to anger or sadness or closeness, right, then they're going to have a rise in that inhibitory affect, and then that's going to deploy the defense. Once the inhibitory affect is high enough that it's employing defenses, then, then the person is actually cut off from their feeling. They're cut off from experiencing affect, but also cut off from experiencing closeness to themselves and closeness to others. So, uh, so the triangle of conflict really helps you see when somebody is blocking an affect with um, inhibitory affect or, or defenses. The triangle of person um, represents um, the relationships where the pattern of conflict is played out. And I saw that typo. I'll, I'll fix it when we're done with the webinar. Um, so, you know, what, what do you need to understand? And, and, and believe me when I say this question is more about the triangle of person than it is about the triangle of conflict. You need to understand that Children um, develop affect phobias when um, there's something that is shameful, frightening, or painful about their inner emotional responses. 
it's they're also developed in trauma too and so someone is in a shocking traumatic situation where they'll cut off access to feeling and and then continue to cut off a, as they grow older and so there's a lot of things that people will do in order to avoid um, behaviors um, feelings and thoughts that have to um, that are associated with an activating affect and again we talked about this last week any feeling can be defensive so you know I've worked with people who are so anxious that they're anxious about their anxiety and at that point their anxiety becomes a defense or they're so anxious they get panic attacks and believe me the minute someone is no longer able to breathe or, or stay present in a room they're, they're just they're completely cut off from um, themselves, another person, and, and their other feelings, and uh, and so, but you have to keep in mind, like when we're working with defenses, we're also working on the triangle of person. You know, we're it, it's that's where it originates from, and you want to be getting a sense of what happened, who did it happen with, and and that's going to really help you. So here is um, Malin's triangle of conflict. We have defenses here. And I, uh, you know, one thing that I always appreciated Nakun for is that he said with defenses, you always want to be looking for things that are odd, quirky, or off. So there's been many times I've been in session where I just didn't know if something was a defense or not. And all I would have to do is ask myself, is it odd? Yes. Is it quirky? Yes. Is it off? Yes. It must be a defense. And remember, we're very compassionate when we do this work together, meaning if we put something down as a defense and later on we go, oh, no, that was more inhibitory affect, well, then we can change it. It's okay. And that's why us developing our own compassionate um, uh, way of being is so important because we can't be anxious about being perfect when we're doing this work. If we're anxious about being perfect, we're going to miss a lot. If we can be calm, accepting, and compassionate, then we help ourselves stay open, and then we just make changes when we need to. And, you know, one thing that I've learned about APT is you have to be flexible. You have to be willing to kind of move things around, to make mistakes, uh, and, and if you are, then you're going to do really well with the model. If, if you're too rigid and everything's right or wrong, and, and then you start beating up on yourself for not doing it correctly, then you're going to have a really, really tough time. And so really practice compassion as much as you can um, because then it's going to help you be able to do the triangles. So again, I showed this slide at our last webinar, but it's important to show again. You know, these are um, examples of maladaptive defenses. And, um, and so any self-attack defense, okay? any hopelessness, defense. Any like self-dismissiveness, over-focus on others, defense. Um, impulsivity, I mean sometimes impulsivity can be with excitement, you know, and that, that's more of an adaptive affect, but if people are just being impulsive to the point that it's destructive, then you want to be looking at that. And one great phrase to keep in mind, and I learned this from Case Cornelison, is, is this destructive? or is it constructive? And so if you're trying to figure out if something's a defense or not, just ask yourself, is this destructive? Or if, if you feel like you don't have the right answer, ask your client, I'm just so curious, is, is this aggression destructive or is it constructive? And their answer will help you be able to put it on the triangle. So, uh, and again, you're going to hear this over and over and over again, any affect can be used um, as a maladaptive expression of affect. And, you know, there's a lot of people who can get really angry for themselves, but what they really need to do is feel great sadness and cry. Or a lot of people can feel weepy and sad, but what, what they really need to do is be able to assert themselves and set limits. And so if you're thinking all the time, is this constructive, is this destructive, is it helpful, is this unhelpful, it'll help you be able to figure out if you're working with the defense or not. Um, so these are just great examples of defenses in session, and I have to admit that sometimes I do them myself, uh, smiling, laughing, joking, um, showing no emotion, changing the subject, 
talking talking quickly without any connection to feeling or another person. That reminds me, I should slow down. <laughs> um, agreeing to everything without making their own um, decision. Uh, so, and now we're going to move to the feeling pull. And, and for those of you who are new, we call each corner of the triangle a pull. So this is the feeling pull. There was the defense pull. There's the inhibit, inhibition pull, which I usually call an inhibitory affect, or a lot of times we call anxiety pull because it's easier. And so, um, you know, with the feeling pull, I brought back some slides from last time. Um, these are the um, activating affects from McCullough. So when we're looking at the feeling pull, we're looking at all the feelings that are adaptive and associated with um, emotion, action. And so we can also look at Pangsep's list too. And uh, and so and it's great because if you ha working with Pangsep's list and McCullough's list, you have a lot of flexibility here. But you know, know that one important thing with adaptive affect is like seeking, being curious, um, having a desire to know. You know, being open, and um, and another thing is, is fear sometimes is adaptive, sometimes it's inhibitory. In this case, if somebody has a real reason to feel fear, and and that fear activates them into motion to protect themselves, I'm afraid of someone grabbing a bat to protect myself. That's really adaptive. Um, you know, lust. If someone's having like sexual feelings that like are constructive and helpful to them in their relationship, that's lovely. But if they're doing things that are hurtful to them or another person, then it's considered defensive. You know, care is um, certainly, um, you know, an adaptive affect. And, and there's just a tremendous amount of behaviors associated with it. And so, you know, it's even okay to look at care. You know, you're, you're demonstrating care when you ask your patient, how are you feeling right now? What are you noticing right now? Would you like a cup of water? Would you like a cup of tea? Um, it's interesting with paying up the panic grief separation system. This is he's talking about the healthy separation system, that that anxiety that you feel when someone that you love pulls away or leaves. Like I'll, I'll be leaving for a big trip on Saturday, and already I can feel my separation system kind of open up with my family as, as I prepare for this trip. And you know, and so I'm thinking about what can I go shopping for or how can I set up the house so that when I leave, everyone will be taken care of. And that, that's a real demonstration of um, care, but it's also connected with um, the separation system piece too. And of course, play. And the great thing is, is with Pangsep's work out, we're seeing more therapists be more playful in session. And I just think it's one of the best things that are happening for our patients. It's okay to laugh in session. It doesn't have to be a defense, but sometimes it is. So, um, so what do you need to know about inhibitory affect? Um, it's all about holding back, reining in. Right, and and it's to it's to help someone stay away from the adaptive um, activating affects, um, and you know you know it's important to keep in mind that all of us need inhibitory affects. Um, in fact, you usually see a rise in inhibitory affect before someone gateways into a, um, an affect that they've been avoiding. Uh, you know, and inhibitory affects can kind of alert us to when something's not okay. You know it. You're with someone, you're in conversation, and all of a sudden you get a little bit anxious, but you don't know why. At the very least, it's a signal for you to be paying attention, paying attention to the person, right? It, are they activating something inside of you, or are they actually doing something that, that you need to be paying attention to? And, um, of course, if there's too much inhibitory affect, then there's the activation of defenses, and then you have the affect phobia. Um, so we're just going to look at the anxiety pull here, and, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about inhibitory affects. We did that last time, but just we'll do it quickly again this time. Repetition is always important. And so, you know, remember that anxiety is a good thing. We want it, right? Um, but it's a matter of too little, too much, right? And too much, we have an affect phobia, too little, and we're missing signals that could be helpful to us. Um, with guilt, it certainly um, helps you um, know if you're doing something that you should not have done or you have done something that you shouldn't have done. 
But then too much of it can really turn into enormous amount of self-attack and self-hatred. I think a lot of us see this in our um, sessions. And uh, too much guilt means that people might be doing things that they really ought not be doing. And I'm not going to refer to any presidential candidates right now. <laughs> so I'll wait till after the election. Um, shame it kind of lets you know when you're behaving in an unacceptable way. But one of the big problems is, is that a lot of children are brought up with a lot of shame. And they're taught to be shameful for things that are absolutely fine to be experiencing. And so in, as a therapist, we're always reworking that over and over and over and over again. And I see it mostly with my trauma um, clients. Um, just there's so much shame for things that other people have done, right? But but the, the survivor is the one holding the shame. So, um, so just to get a sense of what the triangle conflict looks like when it's done, you know, it's um, you know, over at defenses, you have all these different defenses and, uh, you know, suicidal feelings, um, crying when angry, depression, um, pathological mourning. I see that a lot in my office, um, misdirected rage. And so when you're working, um, you know, some of us use um, pieces of paper with the triangle. Some of us just imagine the triangle in our mind. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the best thing that you can do is look at your triangles because your triangles can signal to you what, what needs to be done. So if we look at this triangle, let's say this was um, someone that we were all retreating together. There's so many defenses. It just tells me, like, oh, I need to do a lot of defense work with per this person, which means I also need to do a lot of anxiety regulation. And so if I'm thinking about what my focus is for treatment, it's going to be um, defense restructuring, right, and anxiety regulation, and I'm probably not going to move toward an affect exposure until my patient has a better idea of what their defenses are, right, and, and a better idea of how they're experiencing anxiety in their body. Because I want people to be resourced before we start working with affect exposures. And remember, this is a collaborative model. We're working with our clients in, in tandem with our clients. We're not working separately. So let's go to the triangle of person. Um, I started out as a child to adolescent therapist, and the triangle of person is, is like my most comfortable domain. Because when you have children and adolescents walk th through your door, you're actually kind of becoming a part of what will be their past um, pull. And so, um, you know, don't be um, concerned that I put the therapist down at the bottom and the past up at the left. I know on other slides it's switched around. This is just what's more comfortable for me to work with as a clinician. But if you go to the past and you remember we're looking at where do defenses originate from, you want to be asking yourself, did their mom teach them? Did their father teach them? Did grandma teach them? Is it an extension of intergenerational trauma, meaning it's been going from one generation to another generation to another generation? Um, did their friends teach them? Were there lost loves? And remember, lost loves can be a real powerful source in ABT um, because a person's usually internalized the love of someone who's gone. And so there might be a lot of grief or guilt there, but there's also tends to be a lot of positive feelings too, and that could be helpful when you're working um, with closeness. Uh, was there a traumatic event? You know, um, did they receive behavioral training through religion, culture, or gender? Um, you know, you want to be kind of looking at their culture, looking at how they're raised to see what messages are there. You speak to any Roman Catholic out there, they'll just tell you that they internalized guilt at a very young age and that they felt guilty for everything that they've done. If you speak to someone who's Asian, they'll tell you that they feel absolute guilt with drawing any attention to themselves, that it's always supposed to be other focused. And so when you're sitting with someone, you want to get an understanding of what's the flavor of their life, where do they come from? And then over on the current side, you want to be looking at, okay, if the origin of a defense started with the mother, how is it playing out with people in their current life? Their, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their husband, their wife, their friends, their colleagues. Um, to be honest with you, I hear a lot of work relationships where people are transferring feelings of their mother or father onto their boss. And, um, and then havoc reigns. 
And, and then you'll want to be looking at how does um, the defensive pattern uh, play out with you as the therapist and how did it play out with past therapists. And um, that's, that's really, really important to understand because one thing that I know, especially with my patients who um, have a lot of trauma work, is that they get more resistant the closer we get to accessing affect. And that's when a lot of the acting out occurs within the relationship. And more often than not, I'm able to link it to the past if I'm really paying attention to the behaviors. And so be, being a behavioralist in the APT is really helpful because it's sort of like we're looking for patterns, right? We're, we're really looking for patterns. And if we have the patterns in place, it's a lot easier to work the model. So, um, so how, do you, how do you fill out the triangle of past? Uh, simply put family of origin relationships in the past, put current relationships in the current, and then put you and anyone else who acts as a therapist in their life under the therapist. So, um, so it's important to remember that maladaptive patterns that start in childhood are transferred into present relationships and, and also into the relationship with the therapist. And so you're looking for those patterns. Um, Jim Donovan, who's the author of our book that's coming out, Paraverbal Communication and Psychotherapy Beyond the Words, you know, he says that there's usually three fights. That when someone comes in with a problem, you want to find out you know, how, how that problem has interacted with three people, their mother, their father, their boyfriend, right? And so I used to have fun just looking for threes um, whenever um, patterns would emerge with, with my patients. And more often than not, there are threes. If there's a two, I'll be like, hmm, maybe I'll find a three. <laughs> or maybe the three will come out in the relationship. Uh, so, um, so you're really looking for patterns of conflict within relationships and paying attention to frequency and severity because that's going to tell you how, um, how problematic the affect phobia is. So um, part three is just making important distinctions about feelings. And, um, and so, you know, how can you tell if a feeling is adaptive or maladaptive? Adaptive has behavior and action. It's emotion. Inhibitory is restricting, restraining. It's, it's causing you to pull back. And, and so you always want to um, be paying attention to what, what behavior is associated with the affect. I didn't include this, um, but you know, defensive behaviors tend to, um, to, be, to cause a cut off. Like the person's just completely cut off from themselves and from other people. And again, there's no action. So if they're defensively crying, they're crying, they're crying, they're crying, they're crying, and they're getting absolutely no relief, no action. If they're adaptively crying, they're crying, and, and there's like a lot of physiological um, movement that's happening, and they're reaching out to another person, and they're receiving comfort. A lot, there's a lot of emotion with sadness. And, um, and so if you're just looking for the motion, you know, that's going to help you. Is, is there any motion? Is there any behavior with this feeling that I'm seeing? If, if there is, then it's adaptive. If there isn't, you're looking at it being more defensive or inhibitory. But inhibitory has motion too because it's a pulling back. right? Defensive is more like a wall. So if, if I'm getting ready to have, um, I'm anxious, right? I'm feeling all that anxiety inside of myself. You know, but then it rises to a panic attack. The minute the panic attack happens, it's a wall. I'm cut off. And so, again, there's no motion. But I guess with inhibitory, there is motion. It's just not motion forward. It's motion backward. Um, and so here are some examples of maladaptive affect, regressive rage, exaggerated grieving, um, weepiness with no relief, and desperate longing. And I see all of those in, in my um, office. And so, you know, just real quick, we're, we're going to give you just a little taster of um, systematic desensitization. And, uh, and, and it's a way to kind of help make sense of how to use the Malin triangles on, for treatment. And so here's the exposure strategy. And you're going to see this in upcoming webinars too. But um, basically, when you're looking at someone and you're looking at the triangle person, you want to be paying attention to are they on the anxiety pole, the defense pole, or the feeling pole. And depending on where they are, what pole they are, that signals to you what your intervention is. 
if they're in, on the anxiety pool, you're going to be doing anxiety regulation. It's going to be a lot of cognitive work. It's going to be a lot of like sensory kind of exploration work, right? So, you know, what is the scariest thing about feeling your anger or how does that anxiety feel in your body when you're facing anger? On, on the defense pool, it's um, defense restructuring and we're really looking at stopping the defenses. We use um, core conflict formulation, um, which we'll be talking about in um, an upcoming um, uh, webinar. And, um, and it's about defense recognition and defense relinquishing. You really want to be practicing your mirroring skills, like how to mirror back to your client what you see. You want to be practicing your motivational intervie interviewing skills, um, helping people to identify their cost and benefits of their defense. Um, on the feeling pool, it's affect and self-other restructuring. And so this is like the experiential side of, um, of APT. It's, it's really where I love um, to work. And it's all about exposure and desensitization. It's experiential. You're using imagery. And this is where um, we do a lot of our portrayals. And, um, and so, you know, an another thing to think about is that you see that feeling pull. If someone has an aphophobia, there's literally a line across the, the triangle so that the anxiety and defenses are preventing the person from feeling the um, activating um, affect. And so if you are working well, you're doing anxiety regulation, you're blocking the defense, you're going back and forth, hopefully there'll be a gateway to feeling. And so you have to really know how to do all these different interventions in APT. Um, in order to work through an affect phobia. With um, defense restructuring, you're helping your clients see their defenses and think about giving them up. With affect restructuring, you're looking at helping your client experience affect without all the inhibitory affect and to express it appropriately. And with self-other restructuring, you're helping your client experience closeness with themselves and others. And so, um, you know, an easy way to know if you've done restructuring is if there's a good ending, right? If somebody is able to experience anger and they're okay, right? It's, it's all well. And for those of you who have seen on, on you know, one of, some of my cases, you've seen um, usually after an exposure, there is a good ending at the end of it. And, and so you're always looking for a good ending, a new ending. Um, so before you even do exposure and desensitization, um, it's really important that you cultivate a safe, open, trusting, therapeutic relationship, that your patient is able to pay attention to their body and emotions, that there's motivation for change, that they actually really want to do this. Don't do anything if somebody doesn't want to do it and get used to asking, you know, do you want us to focus in on that? Is that okay? You want to be cultivating lots of self-care and self-compassion because the minute you start working the triangles, it elicits a lot of anxiety and people need to be able to take care of themselves. You want them to heal when they leave your office, not to decompensate. And, um, you know, personal therapy and supervision, I use it for myself and so I have no problem, you know, recommending that everyone who works with me um, um, uses it too. It's really important for you to be doing your personal therapy and supervision and just practicing over and over and over again. And so um, just real quick, the three steps with desensitization, and we'll be having a webinar just on desensitization, is exposure, response prevention, and anxiety regulation. So you want to expose the adaptive affects, the anxiety comes up, you're going to regulate, the defense comes up, you're going to try and block it if you can. If not, you're going to be working with the defense, right? The anxiety goes down, you push for feeling. And so you just do this over and over and over again in session. And it's amazing how effective it is. And you might be shy, like, I can't believe I'm going to ask this person to face their anger one more time. But it works. And, and so it might take three times, five times. It'll definitely work. Um, and so, you know, we'll have another webinar on anxiety regulation, but basically, you know, this is one of the most important tools that you use because if someone's anxiety is low enough, they'll access affect. If it's high enough, they go to defenses, and your job is to just try and keep them in the middle.
because you do need some anxiety activated to actually access affect. And um, we're not going to go over this too much, but um, you know, basically when we do exposure and desensitization, we focus in on one example and then we focus in on what the person is experiencing in their body and start doing the regulating of anxiety and working with defenses. And so when do you know someone's done is when they're in balance. And so they're in charge of their feelings, not the other way around. They can express um, a wide range of emotion. They live inside and not outside. They experience self-care and self-compassion. And, um, and so that, that's what we're all going for. So just this is our bibliography before we move to um, to questions, and of course there's a lot of McCullough work, but also um, Bhatia is someone that you want to be looking at. If you go to the Affect Phobia website, we have a list of all our publications there. Jack Pangsap, Elizabeth um, uh, Skanka, uh, Alan Shore, Vander Kolk, Paul Alvins. Um, these are all the people that can help you um, learn more about the subject. So, so now we're going to go to um, questions, and um, and so I hope that um, all of this was helpful for for all of you. And uh, excuse me, I'm just going to um, bring move things around just a little bit here. So let's see here, what do we have? Um, we have a hi, Kristen from Daryl. Hello. <laughs> so. Uh, and um, yes, there's a question if I can send slides. And yes, I can um, send a, a copy of the slides. Um, I just need you to email me so that I have your email information and I can get that to you. We'll also be recording this webinar, hopefully, and, um, and knock on wood. And, uh, and then we can um, uh, go ahead and post that. Um, so uh, let's see here. Um, okay, I think I think Jeremy's been answering questions for me. Okay, so here is Elizabeth Rosen. Hello, Elizabeth um, from Sweden. It's so great to see you. Um, I have a feeling it's very dark where you are right now. But you say that in Lee's book, sadism is a defense against the positive feelings of self. I imagine that both goes uh, that goes for um, sadism toward a others as well, sadism, sadism toward yourself, could you say something about it? Yeah, you know, sadism is on, and masochism and sadism, I mean, it's pretty interesting. I mean, on some level, you can't think of them as like an attack of the self, because if you're being sadistic to others, you're certainly cutting off any capacity for them to be in a trusting, um, loving relationship with you. And, um, and so that's a form of self-attack because we're pack animals. We want to be with others. And if we're treating others in a way that is causing them to fear us, then, then we're really cutting off our capacity to, to create community, to be in relationship with others. And, and I do see that as a form of self-attack. Um, and, and so, you know, it's also a form of other attack, but if we stay focused on the self, how we treat other people matters greatly in terms of how they want to be with us and how they treat us. And if you're treating someone in an unkind way, it is going to hurt you very, very much. Um, so, uh, so just bear, me, I'm, bear with me, I'm checking some more. Um, and um, yes, um, I have another request for the slides, and we, we can definitely send that to you. And oh, great, Bart um, Ruben, who's from California. Hi, Bart. <laughs> um, hi, California, where it's very sunny right now, I hope. Um, he asked about loneliness, and I have to tell you, I've really struggled with the concept of loneliness um, and conceptualizing it. You know, I mean, we would put loneliness on the defense pole that that um, it, it's it's a, a form of defense that that loneliness because, you know, you know, there it's hard to come up with a lot of behaviors that are associated with loneliness that that would be considered adaptive. You know, that being said, I know with working depressions, when someone's experiencing loneliness, sometimes it can help them become introspective and for them to kind of reflect on their lives and on their relationships 
and and it can be like one of the stepping stones to creating motivation um, to change, and um, and so you know, so it's it's with loneliness, you know, we tend to put it on the defense pole, but I think we have to kind of use the idea of looking at the loneliness and, and seeing how it's functioning. Because I definitely have worked with some people who their loneliness has actually served them in some way. But I've also worked with a lot of people, and this is probably more of the majority, that just feel chronically lonely. They feel separate from others, they feel lost, they feel far away, and with that loneliness comes hopelessness and, and loss. And you know, loneliness in that way is 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 considered defensive because the person is kind of stuck in this place of loneliness. They're not necessarily moving toward another person in order to like experience like closeness um, with them. And you know, as therapists, I think that we're working with loneliness all the time because you know most people who come to us really do struggle with feeling close to themselves and feeling close to others and you know we're working within the therapeutic relationship and, and we're asking them to increase their awareness inside of their bodies so that they can be aware of what they're experiencing inside however our mere presence is activating you know, the sense of being cared for by another person. You know, it's activating these attachment feelings. And and with that activation, you know, you'll see inhibitory affects come up and then you'll see defensive affects come up if they have a block to closeness with others. And um and so, you know, in, in our sessions, we're actually giving them an exposure to closeness, which is the opposite of loneliness, and we're asking them to be aware, to be aware of what they're experiencing inside, to be aware of what they're experiencing inside in relationship to us. And so something that I am frequently saying um, these days is, you know, what what is it like for you, um, what, what is it like for you to, um, have me pay attention to you. You know, what, what is it like for you to have me ask these questions of you? Um, what is it like for you to have me be here with you while you're experiencing loneliness? So all of that's a, a closeness exposure over and over and over again, and it really kind of links with Jack Pangsup's work there. And, you know, and so in session, the person who's experiencing loneliness is now experiencing exposure to closeness and it doesn't even have to be us asking things. It could be simply we open the door, we say hello, we say have a seat here. It's all an exposure. So loneliness, um, you know, is is thought of as a defense. Um, we work with closeness within the therapeutic relationship in order to resolve the loneliness. But again, you know, I, I think that there are times when loneliness can actually be adaptive for people because it, it can help with self-reflection, um, you know, or motivation. And um, and so, you know, when I'm doing the um, depression workshop in Amsterdam on um, November 1st, um, we'll be talking about, like, the two types of depression, how there's, like, kind of a working situational depression and there's chronic depression. And I'll tell you, all of my clients with chronic depression experience loneliness. There is nothing adaptive about it. It's all maladaptive. With my clients experiencing situational depressions, working depressions, sometimes it's the first time, it's the first piece of them becoming self-reflective and finding their motivation to like face um, the, the difficulties that they have with their feelings or with relationships. So so th thank you for that question. Um, you know, so, um, Sherry um, Grady, hi Sherry, I thank you from um, down south in the United States and, and you're new to everyone. Um, but you were um, asking, is it fair to say the state of loneliness may be a result of the use of defenses? Absolutely. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people experience loneliness because of their defenses. And so, you know, in APT, a lot of times, you know, we see our clients actually grieving um, the, the cost of their defenses. And, and that actually goes down onto the triangle of feeling. It's like I'm experiencing true grief because of the cost of my defense. 
And loneliness, if you look at that um, sadism question from Elizabeth Rosen, loneliness, it, it can be a direct cost of like sadistic behavior towards others. And, and I see that all the time in my session. It does play out in the therapeutic relationship. And so the trick a lot of times is learning how to disclose the impact in session. If somebody's being sadistic in session, that's increasing their loneliness. How can you begin to talk to your client about it so that they can own that sadism is a defense of theirs and it's part of the reasons why they feel lonely? And so, yeah, loneliness is certainly related to defensiveness. And, and I'd say I think we see loneliness with defensiveness that all the time. You know, it's just kind of it weaves in and out. It's a part of the fabric. Um, and so, yeah, so we just have a few more minutes. If, if anyone has a question that they really want to get in, th now's the time because I have to be honest with you, it's, it's so much easier to answer questions, um, you know, on the webinar because it, it allows me to kind of help you see all the different textures of, of the work that we're doing. I mean, the great thing about David Mallon's triangles is that it's like our foundational piece. Like, if you know those triangles and you can just be able to say, oh, that's an inhibitory affect, that's defensive, that's adaptive, if you could just fill out those triangles, and then if you can begin to look at the defenses and just say, okay, where did that defense come from? Where did depersonalization come from? You know, anyone um, who's familiar with depersonalization knows that it's related to dissociation, right? And most people develop dissociation at a younger age, you know, when, when they're toddlers, um, maybe even infants. And so it, it kind of points to early childhood trauma. Um, the book that you want to get, and I think this book helped me out with really understanding the triangles, is Bruce Perry's book, um, The Boy Who Grew Up as a Dog. I don't know if I have the title right. Uh, the Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. And um, Bruce Perry's book, it's a real easy re read. It's fun to read. It's a great way for you to begin to understand how the triangle of conflict is related to the triangle of person. And, you know, I just um, was talking with a, a bunch of um, other trainers today, and the thing that we were focused in on the most was the fact that the triangle of person is, is, is so important and we give so little attention to it. And, and it is where the apic phobia originates from. And so if we're able to know who are all the players with the triangle of person, we're really going to be able to, to resolve the, the um, triangle of conflict um, issues. So, um, so, um, so just so you know, someone asked if I do long distance um, consult groups, and what a great question. We're working at it. <laughs> um, everyone who's been training with me for a long time and is here today, they're probably laughing because they've been asking me to do this for years, and I'm finally doing it. And I think we're definitely going to start moving to long distance consult groups um, for a number of reasons. Um, but we're trying to figure out how to do it. And so, like, there is Slack, and I am um, starting to create APT groups on Slack, and Slack allows you to use Google Hangouts to talk with one another. And we can use that as long as we don't show patient video. But there's other ways that we can, um, you know, um, to, to be able to use something where we can look at patient videos. So I will get back to you on, um, on long-distance consult groups. And um, just one more question, and then we'll end. Um, so, so someone um, wrote, it's Daryl Smith. Hi, Daryl. <laughs> um, can self-attack show up on defensive and anxiety pull? Can it be hard to tell the difference sometimes? Interesting. I think self-attack is mostly on the defensive pull. But, you know, if, if you think about it, if because... It becomes a defense when it becomes um, too much um, for, for the anxiety pool. And self-attack is definitely defense. But if somebody is experiencing a lot of anxiety, and maybe it's not high enough that it goes to a defense, but they're actually really not doing anything about it, they're not learning how to regulate, they're not learning how to explore, I mean, you might be able to say that that's a form of self-attack in some way, that they're not taking care of themselves. But typically, self-attack is like a classic defense. 
So I want to say thank you so much. I wish you all the best of luck, whether you're going um, home to your family or you're already at home if you're in Sweden and you're resting for the night, or um, you're in London and you're just beginning to have dinner with your family, or you're here in Boston in the middle of the day, or you're out in California where the day's just beginning. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, and um, I will alert you to our next dates on where, when we'll be having our next um, webinar, and, um, and, uh, and I will um, get that information to you right away. Thanks for coming, and see you again. Bye-bye.